All right, so we have gone through a lot of different exercises and projects about controlling layers, controlling raster files, making vector files, adding them together, all of them kind of unified on our, on our interest in shape and interesting shapes and control of shapes and how they get designed and how they can be controlled. The last assignment that I will grade is something called digital painting, which is like digital coloring, but without the outline to guide you. And so this was an example from a few semesters ago. And this is a portrait of one of my favorite authors, uh, James Joyce, who wrote Ulysses and Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man. And what's interesting about this is even though this was entirely created digitally, I don't think most people would look at it and think that these were, you know, paint marks. They definitely don't look like flat color. They don't look like smooth gradations. They, they don't even look mechanical, like um, half-tone dots, right? And that's just because you can use your brushes in Photoshop and customize them to a great extent to get very different effects. And I was going for more of like a printmaking, like a monoprint, watercolor, rice paper effect with this portrait. Now, if you go back to your handout, that we use for our spot illustration and for digital coloring. This is the one we can download off of links in Canvas. You see that digital painting, this is, these are all my portraits of James Joyce. Um, they can be worked up in, in a variety of ways. So we're going to be looking at, I'll try to demo these different approaches, right? But just like any kind of painting, you can approach it representationally, where you're really trying to match reality, even though I'm playing pretty fast and loose with colors here. But what's so great about digital art is then it can also be very easily abstracted. You can just turn off certain layers or approach it a different way and really uh, make it more extreme. You can even push it to being almost non-representational here and just enjoy the marks. And you can composite different things together. So this is James Joyce composited with some of his plot sketches for Ulysses. He's an experiment, experimental writer who would kind of draw out timelines in like loose, surreal sketches and then write his novels based on them. So it kind of shows his thought process. And then the one I showed you was kind of my finished. It's not any one of these. It was kind of using a little bit of his own drawings as a background for, for some of the abstraction. Now, what are the basic steps to representational digital painting? Because before you can really have fun and be stylistic, you need to know how to match and use the tools to control the tools to match reality. So I'm going to ask you to find photo reference of what you want to paint, whether it's a portrait or an animal. And so here you can see very representational. These are not my own examples. These are just from online. Um, very representational examples of finished paintings. How are they different than the digital coloring of the lemon? They do not start with an outline. They might start with a sketch, or they can start with just a shape. And you'll see both of those approaches. And I'll do it both ways. If I'm going for more abstraction and more personality, I'll start with the shape and just use shaped brushes entirely. And I call that speed painting or shape painting. But if I'm really trying to control the effect and be a little bit more analytical, I'll start with kind of a digital pencil sketch underneath. But it's always underneath. So your painting starts to, to work on top of it and overtake it very quickly. And in that way, it's quite different than digital coloring. Um, with shape painting, you'll see that it almost goes immediately to do a tone. So even though you acknowledge the flat local colors, just by the nature of the brushes you choose and their slightly soft edges. You see, even just in this step, even in this step, because you generally digitally paint at less than 100% opacity so that your paints blend a little bit, you start to get duotone effects right away. And in that way, it's quite different than digital coloring as well. You are creating, the big difference is you are creating your own edges instead of letting the lines from digital coloring create the edges for you. And in doing that, you're playing with hard and soft edges all the time. And you're adding highlights and shadows all the time. And you're even adding full spectrum color a little bit. You see the oranges that are in the green. And you start to see the kind of greenish shadows in the brown. 
and you'll deal with hard edges and then soften them and distort them and do whatever techniques you need. Instead of doing texture fills or overlays like we've done in the past, we're going to do this with brushes, with different brushes that are more splattered or more together or more textured or softer. And at the end, you know, lots of little marks, little fussing to finish off this kiwi with all of its depth and all of its texture, with things that look wet and things that look dry and things that look bristly and things that look smooth. And all of that's very possible. You can see that with the apple as well. All of that's just built up with digital brushes and tools. Lots of layers at somewhat low opacities, all layering on top of each other. So the closest thing to a traditional you know, analog painting technique is oil paint and glazing where you can use transparent pigments in multiple layers over the top of base layers. Okay, so how can we start this project for assignment nine? Well, first you have to pick your reference. So I like to choose um, artists that I'm inspired by. And because I'm doing a visual art representation of them, it's fun to pick an artist from a different discipline. So I'm gonna go back to another writer this is a writer named James Baldwin, who was very influential to me, especially in, in high school. Uh, if Beale Street Could Talk was my favorite novel in high school. And he has just, you know, amazing way of writing. It has a lot of conviction and a lot of honesty to it. So here are some photo portraits of him. And he has a very distinctive look, right? And basically, when you're ever doing a caricature of a portrait of someone, you shouldn't just rely on one photo. You should try to get a few different types of lighting, a few different ages, a few different angles on the face, different, definitely. And then I thought it would be interesting. People, he's a very celebrated um, figure in literature, especially in like the Harlem Renaissance and in the civil rights in the 60s. And he, he's had like Time magazine covers. And this is a traditional painting of him, right? And so it can be helpful to see how others have painted him. So this was a nice watercolor painting of him. There are some oil paintings of him. You know, it's done more of an Austrian secessionist, expressionist movement style. You have kind of fan art examples of him. It's an interesting color palette. And then some that just don't look like him at all. They have kind of the, the approach, like the heaviness of line or the abstraction that I think might relate. Because his work is very, very much about honest human emotion and honest human struggle. And so all of these are kind of going to influence how I decide to paint. So just like painting, it's not enough just to reproduce reality. We want to have those skills, have those abilities. But then you might decide, well, what kind of colors am I going to add to it? What kind of edges? What kind of lines? What kind of shapes are going to give it more personality? Like I did with James Joyce. So that, those are challenges I give myself. Here's another one showing kind of young. And that's what I think of as, as his self-image. You know, this very um, virile and sophisticated, you know, young black man in America. So what reference is going to be most useful to me? Well, I keep them all in a folder. For starting it out, I think this reference is going to be quite helpful. And I think these two references, this is the age I want to kind of capture. There's a few reasons for that. It's easier to draw portraits and caricatures of men than it is of women. And it's easier to draw portraits and caricatures of older people rather than younger people. And it's all for the same reason. The more they have on their face <laughs> to kind of map it out, the more topography they have, the more you as an artist have to work with. It's easier to draw a Sharpe than like a hairless cat kitten because there's more features to draw, right? Sharpe is that, that dog with all the wrinkles. So why are women harder? It's simply because in the, the Western standard of beauty for like celebrity women or portraits of women or even, you know, older authors that aren't known for their looks, 
you feel this cultural compulsion not to show every wrinkle, you know, not to show every splotch in their skin. But for some reason with old men, it's okay, right? It gives them character. So it's me giving myself a little bit of a buffer. But challenge yourself. And if, if you want to, and I, I did a female in my last demo, um, try to challenge yourself not to be bound by vanity, you know, by making people look good. <laughs> and that will help, especially if you're new to digital painting. So these are the three references I'm going to use the most. So what do I do? Well, I start, and this is really the first time we've done this, even though I'm not going to use these pixels at all, I'm going to start by opening those three references up in Photoshop. So let me identify them with a color. These are the three that are most useful to me for this stage because they kind of show me what I can get away with. So I'm going to open up all three of those. Where's the one I'm missing? Here it is. Then I have this other one which could be useful but doesn't seem quite as good as this one. Notice some of these are very low resolution. It doesn't really matter. because I'm not stealing their pixels, I'm just looking at them. So I'm going to open those with Photoshop. And this is a skill we just touched on slightly um, for digital coloring, but we're going to organize them off to the side so that we can steal colors from them if we need to, but also just so they're in our workspace. Just like if you were working on a painting, you might have photographs tacked up to your desk or tacked up to the wall. So now that I have these three, I'm going to create a new file. And because we're creating all of our own pixels, I am going to, to make it my digital painting project, assignment nine, spring 2017. And I want to make this very, very, very large resolution. Because if I'm going to do all the work to create every pixel myself, I might as well make it high quality. So I'm going to do 16 by 20 by 350. That's basically the largest standard size we can print at our standard lab resolution, which is already a little bit higher than professional resolution. I'm going to use everything else the same. And we're good. All right, now... I'm going to move that, the file I created, all the way over to the left, and I'm going to have it highlighted among my tabs, and I'm going to say Window, Arrange, 3 Upstack. Then what it's going to do is it's going to put two of my references off to the side next to my canvas, and I can work with these borders, give myself a little bit more space, and I can work with these individual references, zooming in and out, just like printing different size photos and arranging them next to your desk, next to your easel. You get a little tricky to hit these borders just right so that you can move them, but I assure you that you can. And then I have this third one, which will be for more of the painting stage, and I'm going to move it down into this column so that I can work between these two. But right now I want the photos. So I'm going to start by laying it out. So the goal is to only use the brush. And just stay on the brush tool. We're going to learn how to customize a brush. And then I'm just going to hold down Option to steal colors. So I'm staying on the brush tool. But I'll steal colors. So the brush I have right now is a very standard brush. It's pressure sensitive for size. Let me make it pretty big so you can see that. And if I steal colors, it looks like this. It's at 100% opacity. All the tools are up here. And so if I don't customize my brush, I can do a painting with these very kind of clunky shapes. And I can just jump right in and start. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm going to show you a few different approaches. And the first thing we'll do in the next demo, and we have time for this today, luckily, um, is I'll customize a brush. So even from the very beginning, I'm not creating really, really hard-edged flat shapes. Instead, I'll create something that's more like sponge painting, a little bit softer, um, something that blends with the 
the other colors a little bit better will be a slightly lower opacity. And I'll do that by customizing my